Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, my students here at the university know that I'm rather prone to non sequiturs, uh, but this might trump all of them. So as I was sitting in my office in Craigie Hall and thinking about the theme of today's event, building a legacy and how it relates to music, uh, the first thing I thought of uh, was this, if my clicker works there. Um, actually, it looks a bit like this sculpture here. Uh, interesting. Um, no, I'm not the astronaut presenting today. Uh, he's coming later. But I promise this is relevant. This is Voyager 1. NASA sent this off into space in 1977. Um, its main purpose was to study the solar system and then to continue onward into interstellar space forever. Continuing onward until someone or something finds it one day. Uh, who knows if they will, but it is currently the farthest man-made object from Earth. It's 18 billion kilometers away from us right now, sailing ever further away into the distance. So, of course, as we would expect, the main purpose of Voyager was to provide us with new scientific knowledge. Sure. And it did. Uh, but what I'm more interested in is that gold disk on the side of the probe, if you can see that. So let's zoom in. There it is. Um, what do we have here? Well, inscribed on this disk is a message to whoever finds Voyager floating along in space, uh, assuming anyone or anything ever does. Uh, in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, we have a drawing of a hydrogen atom. Next to it, we have a representation of our solar system. And above that, inexplicably, we have directions on how to operate a record player. Why? Well, if we lift off this case, this cover, underneath we find this, the sounds of Earth. Uh, this is what's called the golden record. It contains several things. It has images of sort of day-to-day -day life kind of activities, births, deaths, finding food, um, uh, social structures, building buildings, uh, waiting in line at Tim Hortons downstairs, uh, those sorts of things. But uh, it also has uh, spoken greetings in 55 languages and recordings from nature. Uh, but the great majority of the record is actually taken up with music, recordings of music. And it's music from across the earth. It's Indian ragas, it's Chinese zither music, American popular music, uh, and a lot of classical music. Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, Igor Stravinsky. If you've never heard of Igor Stravinsky, Google him the moment you get home, he's great. Um, so let's step back a moment and consider the fact that this essentially mixed tape is floating through space, getting ever further away from us, and it represents, well, if we go extinct, if our planet gets swallowed up by the sun, this collection of musical recordings is our species' legacy. It's our time capsule. So that raises the question, why over all of man, humanity's creations, um, Shakespeare sonnets, Picasso paintings, why did we choose music to be our legacy? To find an answer to that question, I'd like to jump back to Richmond, Virginia in 1994. Uh, I was an 11-year-old boy. I was out on the town uh, with my dad and my sister. We were going to a Richmond Symphony concert uh, called Kicked Back Classics. It was for families with young children. They could uh, take their kids to a sort of safe place for them to experience classical music for the first time. Uh, they heard music and they heard uh, sort of talking about the music, introducing the pieces, and then at the end there was free pizza, which is a great incentive for an 11-year-old boy. Um, so as we were sitting down, they asked everyone to check their program for a little red ticket. Well, lo and behold, my dad's program had a red ticket in it. He shoved it into my hand, and I was invited to come up to the front with a few other kids. Uh, they showed us to our seats. I was given a seat in the middle of the violin section, and I took my seat, and then they started to perform. And what they played was this. So even those of you who can't read music know this. I'll sing the first phrase, and you will respond, hopefully, in kind. It starts, bum, 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 and then it goes. Oh, that was much better than I was expecting. Well done. Um, 
Yes, yes, yes. Good. We don't even need to do that a second time. So now it's a theme we've all heard a million times. It's a theme that even I, as an 11-year-old, had heard a million times. And in interestingly enough, it is on that golden record floating away from us. So maybe one day an alien species can have heard it a million times and be just as tired of it as we are. But um, anyway, even though I'd heard it a million times, that day it was like I was hearing it for the first time because I was seeing it. I was inside of the orchestra. Uh, and it really was an amazing experience. Uh, these violin bows all moving together, uh, it's like a school of fish or a flock of birds. It's an amazing thing to see uh, from inside and being totally surrounded by the music. It's an amazing experience. Uh, and what it was showing me, which I hadn't experienced before as an 11-year-old, was these emotions that I had no words to express, these emotions that, in fact, would be cheapened by words. Okay? Let's have a listen to just a brief clip from this. And please listen to it as though you're sitting in the orchestra like I was, and that this music is all around you. <laughs> How can we put that into words? How can we put that music into words? It's communicating emotions that all of us feel, but that none of us can verbally describe, partly because we all experience them differently. But that's why this piece and other pieces of music are floating out there in space uh, as our legacy and as our time capsule. It's because they preserve what we as a species, as a society, what we really care about. Um, above all of the day-to-day -day clutter, it's that we have the ability to connect with one another on a profound emotional level and that we don't even need words to do it. And so I remember after that concert in 1994, stumbling back to my family in this sort of stupor, this haze, like having just had this amazing experience, and I was like eating my slice of free pizza and not even sort of thinking about the pizza. Um, and I was just wondering, first, how did Beethoven make me feel that way? And second, how do I make other people feel that way? And that's the moment I became a composer. Uh, it's when I started asking how I could move people without using words. Oh, well, there we go. Um, so uh, my job as a composer is to communicate beauty. And beauty can be happy or sad. Uh, in fact, I once heard this great talk by the jazz composer Maria Schneider where she said, and I quote, music is alchemy that turns sadness into beauty. I'll say that one more time. Music is alchemy that turns sadness into beauty. And my job as a composer is to pick you up in whatever emotional state you find yourself in and to move you into a different one that, whether it's happy or it's sad, is immensely beautiful. Okay? So what I'm selling you as a composer, it doesn't caffeinate you, it doesn't keep the lights on, uh, or keep your internet running, what I sell hopefully transports you to a place where your everyday concerns don't matter quite so much. But how do I, how does any composer use sound to communicate emotion? Uh, that's a topic for lifelong study, frankly, and we don't have a lifetime here today. Uh, so why don't we just look at an example? Uh, in 2007, uh, a flutist friend of mine, actually a flautist, I think is what they prefer to be called, a flute-playing friend of mine, asked me to write her a piece of music for uh, flute and piano, to, for her to play on a recital. It, uh, it would be a three-minute piece, and it would be for flute and piano. That's all the information I had. So essentially, I had a blank canvas. And in music, this is what a blank canvas looks like. Uh, this is the musical equivalent of something that most of you have probably seen dozens of times, which is that blank Microsoft Word screen with the flashing cursor uh, trying to find that first word of the paper, right? That can be the hardest one. Uh, and for me, this is the most crippling moment uh, as a composer. And I remember when I started writing this piece, uh, I spent countless hours just staring at this page, and I would put one single note on it, and then I wouldn't know quite where to go from there, and so I'd erase it, and so then I'd have a blank canvas with a smudge on it, and that was all I had. Uh, and that went on for days. Um, so I really needed a spark, a spark for an idea. Um, and I don't know about you, but sometimes the most difficult thing for me 
is finding inspiration when you're sitting in the exact same room that you were sitting in yesterday and the day before that, or at the same computer screen you were sitting at yesterday and the day before that and the day before that. Um, and you really need a new idea, but there's nothing new in your life to really react to. Well, the nicest thing about living and being alive and being in our world is that truly inspiration is all around us. Um, even, you know, the previous speaker is so inspiring. Everyone around us, everyone in this room is hugely inspiring. And we live in this world full of incredible people who have left amazing legacies, and we have instant access to them online in a library. Uh, we can just pull up these amazing works of art. Um, so if we're feeling totally dried up, as I was staring at this blank canvas, we can call in creative life support in an instant, okay? And that's what I did. So I went over to the bookshelf and I picked up the dustiest book I could find, which was a copy of Shakespeare's Hamlet that I had procured as a high schooler and had not read since then, <laughs> happily so. But I picked it up and I highly encourage reading Shakespeare recreationally. I think it's frankly so much better to read it recreationally than it is to read it for a class. Uh, you can experience it in a totally different way. Uh, but so I was reading it, and I was reading, I was not paying any attention to Hamlet, who I think is pretty dull. He's just this messed up guy, and he can't get anything together, and he keeps making these mistakes. And so, but who I was paying attention to was his sort of on-again, off-again love interest, Ophelia. She's an amazing, amazing character. Uh, throughout the play, we see her story unfold mostly in the background. Her life over the course of the play is totally ruined by other people. It's not her fault at all. And in the end of the play, near the end of the play, if you don't remember, she kills herself. She drowns herself. And her descent into madness, her suicide, is a reflection of the madness around her. She is sort of the canary in the coal mine figure. And she kills herself by drowning, but it happens off stage, so we never even get to hear her last words. And I wanted to hear her last words. I wanted to know what she said before she, before she drowned herself. So suddenly, finally, I had an idea for a piece. The piece, it, it was going to be a kind of wordless final monologue for Ophelia, where she could finally say what she needed to say. And so then I had a title. The title was, oh, the last words of Ophelia. There, yes, I had a title. Now titles are great, but they don't write music for you. Uh, now that I had a basic idea, I needed to set the scene. I'd have the flutist represent the character of Ophelia and the pianist would represent the sort of situation she was in, the setting, the sad state of affairs. So how do I make music that communicates a sad situation? What do I do for that? Well, I had a mental image of leaves falling from a tree in slow motion, where each leaf is falling at a different speed, but they're all falling, and eventually they're all on the ground. Uh, so how do I translate in that, in that uh, into music? Well, I sort of take each leaf, imagine that as a single descending scale, as a descending musical line that goes down step by step. So um, I created a piano part that was essentially just a tapestry of these falling lines. Um, I'll show you them now. I uh, made each one a different color so that you can see how that happens. Um, there's one descending downward. Now I needed to layer with another. There's another. There's another. There's another. And another. And another. So then I have a piano part that is made of these descending lines, okay? And then over all of that, Ophelia needed to sing. But I imagined her, right as she begins to sing, having a hard time starting. She stutters. Uh, she can't quite get the first word out. So in music, what I did, she sings, plays the same note three times. She can't quite get past that first note, just like I couldn't when I was starting to compose. So here, she has one single D sharp, then another, then another. There we go. Okay, and after that, she begins singing more elaborately. She finds her voice. And over the course of the piece of music, which is only about three minutes long, the piano line is always descending until at the very end it reaches this low chord, which you'll hear, that is this sort of watery grave for her. 
But Ophelia, I didn't want it to just be a sad story. I wanted Ophelia to be redeemed. She's free of the world that has been so terrible to her. And so her line starts at the lowest notes of the flute, that D sharp, and it goes ever higher. She's redeemed by the end. And at the very end, she reaches an incredibly high, incredibly soft note. She flies away, and she's free. So now, uh, rather than continuing to talk you to death, talk this piece to death, I'd like to just play it. Uh, to end my talk. So as you listen to it, uh, try to think of the character of Ophelia. Think of her finding her voice finally and finally overcoming the terrible situation she's in. Okay.